Hello, fellow crafters. This is Yana Smakula for SimonSaysTM.com. Welcome back for another Yippee for Yana video. Today, once again, similar to my previous video, I'm creating a slimline card using non-slimline products. Last time I did the opposite. I used the slimline product on A2 cards. Do watch that video if you haven't already. Now, do you have any ideas about what you'd like the next video to be? Let me know in the comments below. Now, this is the card I shared on my blog a couple of days ago, and I got a lot of comments and questions about it, so I figured I'd use this design, but alter it slightly to make a portrait slimline card and film a video of the process. So, what products are we going to be using? I have two clear stamp sets from Simon Says Stamp, a newer set with a darling Christmas village called Santa's Sleigh Ride Slider. You can use this stamp set to make an interactive slider card and have your Santa ride above the village, but I'm just going to use the village stamp. And in fact, I'll only use a portion of this image. Next, I have an oldie but goodie stamp set. This is Holiday Greetings Mix 1 set. This is a stamp set from last year. It has lots of fabulous sentiments for holiday cards, some of which are just perfect for slimline projects. They are tall and skinny, and even that peaceful sentiment can work on a landscape slimline card. So lots of great options. Now, if you don't have these exact stamps in your stash, do go through your stash, look for similar design products, look for a Christmas village, and look for a tall, skinny sentiment to make this card. I'm going to start by doing my stamping first. I have my Misty stamping tool. I already have a panel of white cardstock and it measures three and a quarter by seven and three quarters. And this is Nina Solar White cardstock. I'm first going to figure out the image placement and I want to stamp just a portion of the village. I really like the houses on the left, so I'll stamp those, the two houses, the trees, and a part of a church. I'm placing the tall skinny sentiment above my village and at first I planned to add my Santa above all of that to have him ride high up in the sky, but I don't have coordinating dies for this stamp set and I didn't feel like cutting the image out using scissors. I'm a little bit lazy like that, plus I can never get my fussy cut images to look as good as the die cut ones, so I decided not to use the Santa for this card. I'll use him for some other projects. Now, because I don't have to fit the Santa in at the top of my card, I can scooch the sentiment up a bit higher and also move my Christmas village a little bit higher as well. Okay, we have our placement figured out. I can remove the sentiment now. I want to heat emboss it, so I'll do that after I do my stamping. First, I need to stamp the village. For this, I'm using Memento Tuxedo Black ink and stamping it several times to have a nice, crisp black outline on my paper. Next, I reposition the sentiment on my panel. This sentiment also has little asterisks built into it. And if you want, you can add additional stars or snowflakes onto the background at this stage to maybe mimic stars or, you know, just add additional interest to the background. The sentiment will be heat embossed in white. So if you want to emboss additional background elements, now is the time to do it. At first, I wanted to add the little stars from the Santa stamp set and even maybe add little snowflakes, but then I decided not to do that as I wanted to add snow to this card in a slightly different way, and I'll show you that at the end of this video. I used my anti-static powder tool, I prepped the background for heat embossing, next I inked the stamp with clear embossing ink and stamped onto the panel, making an impression. I then covered it with detail white embossing powder. You can use a regular grade embossing powder for this sentiment as well. It isn't too detailed. And here you can see me heat setting the powder using my heat tool. I love watching embossing powder melt. There is just something so magical about it. The sentiment currently is white on white, so it is nearly impossible to see it. But you can catch a glimpse of it as I tilt my paper and the light. There, you can see it there for a little bit. Now we need to add color to our panel. Adding color will be broken into two parts, coloring the Christmas village using markers, I'm using Copic markers here, and then adding color to the sky using ink blending and inks. 
To color the village, I'm using just a handful of Copic markers and very basic coloring techniques. Anyone can do this. Let's start with the Christmas trees. I first colored the entire body of the tree using my latest green. This is YG93. Next, I came in with a medium green color and added shading. I made sure to add a small shadow under the ornament, under each ornament on the tree to help the ornaments stand out a bit. Next, I used my darkest green color, YG99, to deepen the shadows. I go back to the medium YG95 color and blend that, and then go to my lightest YG93 and blend the colors even further. Next, to color the houses, I used warm gray markers. So I used the same colors for all of the houses on this card, and I used W5, W3, and W1 markers. Here, I started by applying the darkest color first. I added the darkest color under the roof, under the windows, and on the edges of the houses. Next, I used W3, my medium gray, and blended the color in towards the center of the buildings. Finally, I used the lightest W1 and colored the rest of the image in. You can see this is a very simple coloring, but it really does work here, and I think it looks really nice. I used E33 and E37 to color the roofs of my homes, of my little houses. I wanted to make the roofs wooden. I also used the same color to color the shutters on the windows and even the top part of the chimney. Although the chimney wouldn't necessarily be wooden, it would probably be made from stone, but using brown on that section of the card worked color-wise for my project. So I didn't mind doing that. I love coloring little houses like this, and I find it very calming. I also went back to W5 marker, my darkest gray, and added dark shadows behind the shutters, making it look like they were slightly ajar, and thus casting a shadow on a wall behind them. All of the ornaments on the trees were colored using a single red R27 marker. These were such tiny areas that I decided not to bother with adding shading. I also was planning to use a red card base for my card, so I needed to add pops of red to the village to help it tie together with a red card base. Now, don't forget to color the windows. I colored some of the windows as if they were lit, as if people were home, and some as if nobody was home. The lit windows were colored using Y11 and Y15 markers, while the nobody is home windows were colored using a darkest blue marker from my stash, a B99. And also don't forget to color the star on top of the tree. I colored it yellow as if it was gold. Now, before we can add color to the other part of the panel, before we do any ink blending, we need to protect all of this beautiful coloring. We can do that using a mask. I already have a mask from a previous project I made, and I'm just going to add it onto my image to protect it while I do the ink blending. I made my mask by stamping the village onto masking paper and cutting it out using scissors. It is a tedious task, but if you're careful, a mask can be reused several times, so that makes it worth it in the end. For my ink blending, I'm going to use this media mat from Waffle Flower. I love using it when I do any kind of ink blending on my desk. You can see it's well inked. Um, you can clean it up if you want. The ink easily washes off the mat using warm water and soap or ink cleaning solution. But I don't really mind having my mat like this so I don't really wash it very often. I will, of course, wash it if I am to blend a significantly different ink color than what I have on the mat to avoid ink contamination. But here, since I will be blending blue, I don't mind having all of that leftover ink there. And honestly, I blend with blue inks for the most part. I've added a piece of washi tape to the bottom of the panel where I didn't have any masking done to protect that part from any accidental ink. I'm using a mix of different types of ink for my ink blending today. I'm using Distress Oxide and regular Distress inks as well as dye inks. I prefer to blend with oxides, but my oxide ink collection is very limited at the moment. I just have a handful of colors, so I also use other types of ink from my stash. 
The oxides do blend a lot better compared to any other ink out there, at least in my experience. So if you enjoy ink blending and if you haven't yet tried the oxide inks, do give them a go. You will love blending with these inks, regardless of the brushes or ink blending tools you're using. As I begin adding color to the panel, you can see the white embossed sentiment resist the ink and pop off the page. I love it. I love ink blending over white embossing on white cardstock to reveal that embossed image. So I'm using the speckled egg distress ink as my latest color and I'm blending it from the horizon line about a third up. Next, I'm using a very vibrant blue. This is Mermaid Lagoon Distress Oxide ink and blending it overlapping the speckled egg and bringing it almost all the way to the top of the panel. I added a piece of sticky tape to my fingers. It is sticky side off, so it actually sticks to my fingers and that prevents me from leaving fingerprints on my panel and also prevents my fingers from getting dirty as I do the ink blending. And to finish the sky, I'm blending my darkest blue. This is navy. This is dye ink from Hero Arts. And I'm actually really pressing that ink into the paper to add as much blue as I can. I'm bringing this color down slightly, overlapping with a Mermaid Lagoon color. I also like to use black when I'm ink blending a sky as it adds that rich darkness to the top of the sky and helps the other colors pop. So here I added a little bit of black to the very top and I used Hero Arts Intensified Black ink for that. It's not your typical ink for blending. This is a good ink for stamping images that you plan to color, but I decided I might as well use it since I had it sitting on my desk. As I blended ink over the white embossing, you can see how it dirtied the embossing powder on my panel. Some inks will end up sitting on top of the embossing powder coloring it. Some inks you can wipe off with a cloth, but other types of inks require to be cleaned using a specialty cleaning solution. I like to use Ultra Clean Stamp Cleaning Solution. There's one from Simon Says Stamp, and I also have one from Hero Arts. They are both equally good. The way I've found it easier to clean is I use a new ink blending foam or on an ink blending tool, and I spray the cleaning solution onto the foam. I then press the foam into a cloth to get rid of excess ink and help distribute the solution equally on the ink blending foam. And then I very gently swipe over the embossing, cleaning it up. And here you can see it works like a charm. Now don't press too hard, as if you do press hard, very hard, you might remove ink from the background. So just use gentle motion to clean up the embossing on the panel. And ta-da, that looks as good as new. Like we just embossed it, right? Now, in case you're wondering why I go through all this trouble and not emboss after we've ink blended, well, that's because you need a perfectly dry panel for your heat embossing to end up nice and neat. Right now, the ink on the panel is wet and it will stay wet for a long time. Not wet to the touch, but wet enough to catch embossing powder particles and mess up your beautiful card. So it is better to heat emboss first and then ink blend over the embossing. That gives better results. Remove the masking paper from the bottom of the panel and oh my goodness, this looks so pretty. Now our panel is still obviously lacking some detail. First, I'm going to add color to the snow hill using a B000 marker. You can keep the hill white, but I prefer to add a hint of color to my snow using this color marker. If you want, you can also add a little bit of glitter. That would look really nice as well. Next, I'm going to make a card base, adhere the panel onto the card, and then finish adding details. Here, I have a panel of red cardstock, and I'm scoring it at three and three quarter inches. My scoring board isn't quite long enough to house the eight and a half inch sheet so I score as far as the board goes then I move my paper up a bit and finish scoring all the way. Next I fold the paper and burnish the fold using my bone folder and then I can just trim the excess paper and have myself a perfect slimline card base. Looks like I need to trim the panel a little bit so I'm just going to do that as well just so that everything works perfectly well together. 
Now here I wanted to show you how colored cardstock, colored card base, helps the colors on the card pop. If you use a white card base for this card, which also looks nice, the coloring looks different. It looks cleaner, maybe calmer. On the red card base, it looks a lot more dramatic and maybe even a lot more festive, I think. Now, this is all a matter of personal preference. I prefer to have a lot of drama on my cards, so I'm going with a red card base here. Next, I needed to create a sub-sentiment for this card, and I'm going to hit emboss one that reads, Thinking of you at Christmas time. I am embossing it on the same color card stock as I used for the card base to keep the colors consistent. I used a skinny strip die from my stash to cut the sentiment out. You can also cut it out using a paper trimmer, but I find I like the edges of the panel better when I use a die. And now I'm just foam mounting my little die cut onto the panel above the village and below the sentiment. I like to use my misty ruler to help me position it and make sure that it is centered. Moving on to the final stage of making this card, which is adding snow to the background. Here I have several products, Nouveau Drops in white and three different pens to make three different size dots on the background. All of these are white pens. I'm starting with the largest size pen using a Storytime paint pen from Jane Davenport from Spellbinders. Make sure to shake your pen well before using it to mix the ink inside the pen. And here I'm adding various size dots onto the background. More dots at the top of the card and fewer dots closer to the bottom of the panel mimicking falling snow. I'm not adding any dots over the sentiment as I want that to stay legible, but I am adding dots over the village. This is key, I think, to a realistic snow look. If you want to take it one step further, you can add dimensional detail over the largest dots using Nuva drops in white. Here, I'm adding large dots over the largest drops and also over some medium-sized dots on my background, and that really emphasizes the snow. So that's it for me for today. I hope you've found this video useful and inspirational. If you make a card inspired by this video, I hope you do. We'd love it if you shared your project online and tagged me and Simon Says Stamp on social media. We always enjoy seeing what you guys are making. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and to subscribe to this channel if you haven't yet done so. Thanks so much for joining me today. Love you guys and I'll see you next time.